little bit curious why we don't get a lot of earthquakes like they do in Japan, even though we're on a subduction zone. What's going on there? That's a great question that nobody has a good answer for. Welcome to Geology Talk, our monthly gathering of geology enthusiasts. Our panelists today are once again, Andrew Dunning, Emma Rahalski, Kerry Gordon, and I'm going to kind of slip away to the side here today because I'm nursing one of my headaches. So I'm going to pass the hosting duties to Emma and Kerry, but could each of you, Emma first and then Kerry, introduce yourselves to people who may not know who you are and I will pass the baton. Emma? Um, hi, everybody. For those of you who have not met me yet, my name is Emma Raholski. I'm um, finishing my last year at Portland State in my undergrad, um, getting my Bachelor's of Science in Geology. Um, my main interests are in geochemistry and karst, also in groundwater research as well. And good morning. My name is Carrie Gordon. I'm here in Central Oregon. I'm a retired Forest Service geologist. My interest has been pretty broad in general, although a lot of my career was working in engineering geology. So Emma, all yours. Yeah, so every month we do a segment at the beginning of our meeting uh, with Geology News. Um, Andrew Dunning is a grad student at Portland State and he puts together a wonderful presentation for us, um, presenting all the interesting geology news that's happened since our last meeting. So um, I'll let you take it away, Andrew. This is the geology news for January 2023, first one of the year. Uh, oddly enough, it's been sort of a quiet month, but I'll do my usual routine anyway, starting out with earthquakes because I am an earthquake enthusiast. Biggest earthquake of the month was this magnitude 7.6 offshore of uh, Indonesia, sort of southwest of Indonesia right here. It is a uh, earthquake of what we consider intermediate depth. It's 105 kilometers below the surface, uh, whereas most earthquakes you see uh, happen in sort of the top 20 to 30 kilometers of the crust. This one is quite a bit deeper than that, and it actually occurred inside the subducting oceanic plate of the Australian plate. It is diving down underneath. Uh, there's a whole bunch of micro plates here around Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and uh, sort of that area of the Southwest Pacific Ocean. Excuse me. Um, and these subducting oceanic plates are still cold and brittle enough to rupture in earthquakes as they descend into the mantle. Um, wasn't felt terribly widely in Indonesia, um, but it's sort of a, a good learning experience for uh, demonstrating these interesting seismic processes. There's another magnitude seven event north of Indonesia. It was in the ocean as well. No tsunami from either of these events. And my favorite one from this month was a 6.8 in Argentina. That was very, very deep, 610 kilometers deep. So that is basically, that's in the lower mantle. Um, I don't know or understand why earthquakes happen there. Um, that's a deep focus earthquakes like these that they're called are they're not super rare, but they're not super common either. And um, I don't understand them. I think they're fascinating though. There was another one, uh, a aftershock of similar size and depth, 6.4, but there was another deep focus earthquake underneath Japan, magnitude 6.3, which is right here. Uh, and that was felt by some of the residents of the islands south of the main islands of Japan. Andrew, I have a quick question yeah. with these earthquakes. These really deep focus earthquakes, um, are they commonly felt on the surface? Usually, yes. And usually they're felt over a really wide area. Um, mm -hmm. Depending on the nature of the earthquake, they can either be destructive or not. Usually these 610 kilometer deep earthquakes aren't super damaging um, because the lower mantle is uh, warmer and a little bit uh, less viscous. So it translates seismic waves a little bit worse. Um, so the, the waves that do reach the surface of the crust are a little bit softer. That's not a very good scientific way of describing it. I think it gets the point across. Okay, here in the United States, this is everything uh, greater than a magnitude 2.5 in the month of January. 
The largest event was a strike slip. That is a lateral motion event in the Blanco fracture zone offshore of Bandon, magnitude five. We get these every other month or so. They're quite common and unrelated to the Cascadia subduction zone. These are just going off all the time as the Juan de Fuca plate and the Pacific plate rub against each other in this zone and uh, this fault zone here. Largest earthquake in the United States was a magnitude 5.4, which is an aftershock from the Ferndale earthquake in California, which happened last month. This whole cluster of earthquakes here is related to that uh, earthquake sequence. Most of, the, most of the serious damage from that earthquake is um, uh, getting repaired and slowly recovering despite the uh, other damage from the floods they've been having down there. The most widely felt earthquake from this month was a magnitude 4.2 off of Malibu Beach in Los Angeles, right here. Everyone in the Los Angeles basin felt that. And we've also got ongoing seismic swarms in West Texas and Oklahoma, which are related to oil and gas exploitation. The one that caught my attention most is this 3.3 in Maine. Uh, my understanding is that most earthquakes like this on the Eastern seaboard are reactivations of ancient structures which date back potentially hundreds of millions of years um, and are just related to sort of the continent settling and getting comfortable as it cruises across the earth's surface. Um, I am a little bit curious why we don't get a lot of earthquakes like they do in Japan even though we're on a subduction zone. Um, what's going on there? That's a great question that nobody has a good answer for. Oh cool. <laughs> Once we uh, in geology. <laughs> once we get a major Cascadia earthquake, we will understand things a lot better. Cool, can't wait. Um, but there's a there's a lot of unanswered questions about the way this subduction zone behaves and why we don't have as much micro seismicity. Uh, they mm -hmm. do get a fair amount in the northern areas of uh, British Columbia and even in northern Washington, uh, but pretty much the stretch from about mm -hmm. Australia. Uh, Washington down to Southern Oregon, uh, basically no micro seismicity in that zone. We might get a couple of small events a year. Whereas in Japan, you'll get, uh, if you were to look at a cross section of Japan, uh, you could see earthquakes all the way inside the subducting plate and in the plate to plate interface and all of that going all the way down into the crust across the mm -hmm. whole subduction zone. But we don't have that. And there's not really any good explanations as to why. Okay. <laughs> Concerning. <laughs> All right, volcanic eruptions. Sort of a quiet month for volcanoes around the world. Uh, 46 ongoing and or new volcanic eruptions as of two days ago with substantial activity at Songhai in Ecuador here with a 21,000 foot tall explosive ash plume. And Krakatoa has been uh, making itself known down here in Indonesia. Uh, there's been some significant ash explosions and lava fountaining has been observed. And after a pause of about two weeks, the lava lake returned to Kilauea volcano. Uh, after the Mauna Loa eruption ended, uh, the Kilauea lava lake sort of drained and hardened over. Um, but then last week or so, it, uh, it came back. Uh, the Kilauea volcano system is in this sort of stage right now of occasional lava lake presence, which is interesting. I don't know too much about the magmatic system there, but it, it, it's kind of got these inflation deflation cycles that most similar volcanoes have. I did want to talk about floods and landslides. We had a lot of these going on lately. As you may have heard, intense rain and snowfall in California led to about two weeks of significant flooding uh, across the state in late December and early January. And most of this flooding damage was in the Central Valley which was up until basically the last hundred years, a single enormous floodplain that covered the entire center of the state of California. And now that it is a heavily populated and developed area, floods are um, more damaging than they ever used to be. So right here, we have a little area of riparian growth uh, getting covered by the muddy waters of the, I believe, uh, Merced River drainage. Um, not remembering exactly where this particular image was taken. Uh, this car here doing the smart thing and not proceeding through the water. 
If you're ever driving in a flood zone and you see water covering the road, do not drive over it. Oftentimes the road base is eroded away and you can crash through the asphalt and plummet into the water below. This is downtown Sacramento a couple weeks ago. Um, usually it doesn't look like this. Usually the Sacramento River is much lower than you see here, and all of this is dry, lovely park space. In contrast to some other metropolitan areas, uh, Sacramento has set development back from the riverbanks a little bit. So when flooding does happen, it doesn't immediately flood all of the buildings on the side of the river. All of this area used to be floodplain. Uh, so every time the river level rises in early spring, usually, or historically, I should say, um, the river had plenty of room to expand and grow and feed uh, a huge system of wetlands and uh, riparian forests, effectively. And you can see some of that sort of happening and coming back. Rivers always tend to revert to their original state one way or another, and they deposit silt and sediments all over the place when they flood. And right here, the new silt and sediment is fertilizing the uh, fields and croplands of the Central Valley. These used to be near annual events of this size, roughly, and are uh, actually why the Central Valley has some of the world's most productive farmland. Uh, the silts and the minerals that floodwaters bring in uh, have created an enormous, thick, rich layer of arable topsoil. Another thing we get in California during the rainy season are landslides, uh, especially mudslides like this one in Santa Barbara, which crashed right through the middle of this neighborhood. Uh, these are particularly common in burn areas, and now California has a lot more of those than it used to. So every time we get an intense, uh, really rapid uh, deluge of precipitation, the ground surface, which is already made of pretty loose material in much of coastal California. Um, there's no more plants holding all that stuff together, so the water sheets off and very rarely does it actually infiltrate into the soil. Um, but the way it runs off makes, uh, it collects in these choke points, the tops of gullies, and that leads to flash flooding, and flash flooding in turn will trigger shallow landslides and uh, large mud flows like this one. They all, all the water and mud and rock all mixes together and you get this sort of wet concrete like slurry that plows right through neighborhoods. And now probably the coolest event that happened in this last month was this big landslide from Black's Beach in uh, La Jolla, California. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna go all the way through this video because it's quite long, but I'm hopefully I'm hoping that Carrie will talk a little bit about it. Oops, I don't want the sound. There we go. I guess I'll, I'll give a little background on this here. Uh, so Black's Beach is a, a popular surfing beach in, let me skip ahead a bit, Southern California, just north of San Diego. And what we see here is this uh, seaside cliff here made of uh, actually roughly 30 million year old turbidites, so that's underwater landslides that have been uplifted by tectonic activity in Southern California. And these are really unconsolidated rocks. They're really loose when they get wet, they get muddy, and they're landslide prone even in normal conditions. But some of the areas along the coast have these larger deep seated landslides, which means they go through the depth of the cliff and are uh, able to mobilize huge blocks of land, which is what we see happening here. So everything from this big triangular rock all the way down to the beachfront is an enormous landslide. You can see it's sort of sliding and pulling away right here. That's the edge of this movement. This is what's called the head scarp up here. This is the top of the landslide, and it is coming directly towards the camera operator. And you see lots of smaller rocks falling off of the front of the landslide, oh, yeah, right here, pause, because the whole block is deforming and becoming gooey and stuff is big rocks are falling off and falling towards the camera operator. This is basically the worst place someone can be to observe a landslide. Uh, if you ever find yourself in a similar situation, don't stand in front of it. Uh, Carrie, can you please tell us about this, <laughs> color, this black blob here? So one of the things 
that just went out of our camera view to the left is the fact that uh, there, okay, there, that, that should out of show it. Okay, Andrew, point up to the top scarp up there and then uh, keep on going up with the arrow right up to the top of the ridge and run it all the way to the left. That is all one big, huge landslide scarp. So this interior piece that Andrew was pointing out is what's currently moving, but this whole face all across even to, and I'm assuming we're kind of, is this kind of north, north to the right here or to the left? Yes. Yeah. So one of the things that's all one huge landslide scarf. So here's the fun part. Think about a rotational landslide. Literally, you start from that top head scarf and you have a big arc that goes deep beneath the sands right here. And thank you for filling us in on the, the geology right here, Andrew, because I suspected that was the case, but I did it. I didn't do my homework. So what we're going to see cropping up and poking up at us is this big black unit that must be some of the softer silts, maybe uh, kind of a silt shaley unit that's underneath the turbidites that is now part of part of what's getting rotated up out of the face of that landslide. And because it's coming up into the sand, which is totally unconsolidated, it doesn't really have anything to hold it back. There's no buttress. So it literally is squeezing up onto the sand there. And I have to admit, these folks are way too close to an active landslide. Thank you very much. The guy that was talking about being on a surfboard way out there in the ocean, perfect view yeah. or a drone way above, but not right here because I don't, I don't believe that that's necessarily the bottom of the scarp here because that landslide is a lot bigger than what is currently moving. So it, it was pretty impressive. I wanted to point away up here at the scarp. You can see where it was and has since pulled away. That's, you know, from this distance, that's probably what, 15, 20 feet? At least. Really hard to judge distance on a video that you weren't at, but pretty impressive nonetheless. You see how this whole block has already pulled away from the cliff. Andrew, I know you distinguished mudslides from landslides, but I missed your. Um, discussion as to why they are different. Uh, Carrie, you want to chime in? <laughs> Be glad to. In fact, we'll actually go into that a little deeper detail in my presentation. So the landslide term is the overarching. These are all types of landslides. This particular one, it would potentially be termed rotational. We also have landslides that are called transitional. So you got a, a bunch of rock that is, is tipped and dipping toward the highway and it all slides in a block down toward the highway. That is translational. The rapid shallow events that Andrew was talking about earlier are also landslides, but they're fast moving. They're generally water driven events. And if they are in landscape that has been burned over or has a lighter veg component that doesn't have the tree roots holding that shallow material together, then you get a rain, a rain event and that material is downslope in a very fast, rapid event. That's the mud slurries that Andrew was talking about, where you get material up in the upper headwaters of the drainage, and then next thing you know, it's moving down slope. So these are all types of landslides. And that's the fun part about living in the Willamette Valley, is folks that live in the Willamette Valley see all of these on a regular basis. There's some really cool earth flows just out of Estacada, which are very shallow, moving along every day. And then you have the rapid, rapid debris flows that happen at the drop of a hat after some of our huge rain events. And then you also have a lot of rotational landslides 
Anybody been watching what's going on around Bandon? That highway is in bad shape, and that is a big, huge rotational landslide. A good friend of mine who used to live down in the area said, oh, yeah, the top scarp was just below where her house was located. Yeah. So, yeah, big, a lot of big, huge landslides. And this is pretty impressive. This one is, um, wow. Andrew, I, I have, a, and Car Carrie is also, also I saw this a couple of days ago on uh, Facebook, and it's a much shorter version of it. But right here in the middle, there's a big triangular block. It looks like it's pulled away from the cliff behind and is sitting on top of this uh, unconsolidated uh, rest of the landslide. Is that is that block pulled? Has that block pulled away from the uh, cliff in the background? Yeah, and it's been here. Um at least as long as we've had good aerial imagery, so back into the early 90s. Oh, okay. And I and did some looking in the historical imagery, and it didn't doesn't look like this has moved too much since the early 90s, um, but certainly the heavy rains and heavy seas eroding the toe probably had something to do with its reactivation. And Andrew, when you were looking at it from an air photo standpoint, is that back face tipping is, is it tipping back at an angle against against that upper head scarp? I believe so. I don't remember. I can actually pull it up. Give me a moment. Because what that does is that actually adds to the rotational standpoint, because if you have everything that is all at one elevation and then the scarp itself scoops out underneath. So as this starts moving, it start, it's going to start tipping back. And that's what makes our cool sag ponds that catch the spring water that everybody loves hunting. Well, not here on the coast, but in, <laughs> in mountainous terrain, that's where you're looking to look for your elk and deer and game because they're going to be looking for that water source up elevation out of the creeks. So Andrew, while you looked that up, I kind of had a follow-up question on Wesley's, because Wesley mentioned uh, that this was sitting on top of unconsolidated material. And I was kind of curious, how much of this material do we think is unconsolidated? Is it just that front part that has the rock fall? Um, or and is that whole other chunk kind of like one big whole it's, rock? This is all up arched. Uh, there's a fault here underneath 805, and there's another fault here under La Jolla Parkway. Uh, so this is essentially an anticline. Uh, there's a couple of them here. There's a fold underneath, uh, can't remember the name of this headland. There's a big fold under there. This is all a big fold. Uh, this is all a big fold. So there's a whole train of these folds here that are just uplifted ocean sediment. And they Andrew, I'm, I'm still, excuse me for interrupting, but I'm still seeing your the uh, PowerPoint. I'm not seeing your cool. Oh, wow. <laughs> now we're seeing it. Holy cow. Sorry. So there's big faults along here and here and here and here and here. They're all over the place. This is obviously this is Southern California, one of the most active continental margins in the world. Um, but all of this is a big, oops, it's the wrong button. All of this here is a big anticlinal upward fold of unconsolidated ocean sediment that never got buried and it never got lithified. So it is just, it's just sand and mud. And the landslide is right in here. This right here. Okay, go from a lower view. That's it, that's that big triangular block. And that toe, that big black blob came out from right down here. Does that illuminate things, Wes? Yeah, that's a that's wonderful imagery there. Is, are only geology uh, grads allowed to access this software? What is it? Oh, Earth Pro. Yeah, this is uh, aerial, stereo paired air photo that uh, they run structure for motion on and Basically, you get two pairs of photographs and you make a 3D model out of them. That's all I've got for this month's geology news. I'm going to hand it off to Carrie for her presentation.
Awesome. Yeah. So uh, I guess next we have Carrie talking about um, a 15 year study of Doe Creek, which is a small active landslide in the Ochoco Mountains. Um, I know, Carrie, you gave a little bit of an introduction on your background, um, but if you wanted to add anything else um, as far as how you got involved in this project, I'm pretty curious about your relationship to this. Um, and yeah, uh, I'll pass it over to Carrie. All right. And actually, I, I will actually bring everybody in on how that actually came to happen. So uh, today we're going to be talking about three different topics. We're going to start with landslides across the state, narrow down to the Ochoco Mountains, and then we'll end with the Doe Creek landslide. As a geologist for the Forest Service, I started working in Arizona, well, actually started working up in Ellensburg and then went to Arizona and landed in the Coast Range, where I did see a lot of rapid shallow events. And one of the things that, that um, I found is that landslides are fascinating. But they are also geologic hazards, and that's something that we kind of forget that our landscape is active, whether it be rapid shallow events like debris flows or building on rotational landslides. And you kind of wonder, well, is my house moving? Oh, the whole landscape is moving, as is happening here in these photos. So landslides, yes, are geologic hazards. A number of years ago, Dogami started a statewide landslide information database, also known as Slido. They were gathering data from all of the land managers, as well as Oregon Department of Transportation, and pulling it together into one database. Because a lot of folks said, oh, and I, I got this too when I worked in the Coast Range. <laughs> It's the Coast Range and Cascades. They're the only ones that have landslides. No, that isn't really true. You can see just how dense the landslides are to the Coast Range and the Cascades, but there are landslides across the rest of the state. Gary, and real gonna, quick, uh, yes. did you mean to turn off your video? My video, yes. Be oh, okay. Because I check. have extraordinarily slow up and down internet okay. service. So I didn't want to slow down the video any more than I absolutely had to. And I know it's really hard because I'm doing all sorts of hand <laughs> motions. And you not seeing them. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, no, no worries. I just wanted to check. Okay. All right. So Continue. where where the red arrow is pointing is the Ochoco Mountains. And that's where we're going to be going next. This is the mapping that uh, is part of Slido. And it, for the Ochoco Mountains, can you see my arrow here? For the yes. Ochoco Mountains, this is all of the professionally mapped landslide terrain. This is what happens, and a Andrew was just referencing this type of of mapping is called air photo and terp that's taking resource photo flights and staring through a stereoscope. And I gathered this data over the 20 some odd years that I worked for the Ochoco National Forest on a project by project basis, gathering just uh, dormant landslide terrain, anything that looked like landslides. Now at the time, I thought, oh, well, this is before LIDAR. So it was pretty good additional data that we had. And we had in 96 and 97, that's 1996 and 97, we had a series of heavy rain on snow events. I think some of you may remember those. They caused significant problems in the Coast Range and in, and in the Cascades and further east. And these events, for the most part in the on the Ochoco National Forest, which is what this boundary is, the majority of them were in the dormant landslide terrain. It actually reactivated. So there was a lot of quick 
quick and dirty, oh my gosh, all right, this piece of real estate reactivated, how are we going to repair the roads? And mid-slope roads on landslides, it's not really a good combination. I'm gonna focus in on a big, huge landslide right here that's underneath Spanish Peak. It's, on, it's along a fault scarp on the north side of the Ochico Mountains. But first, I need to give you a quick little introduction to the geology of the Ochico Mountains, because it really does guide where these landslide features are. Got a little bit of Mesozoic terrain down in the far southeast corner of the Ochico Mountains. And then the next younger is, I basically colored all of the Clarno formation bright green because I wanted, wanted it to stand out. Let's see where that Clarno is. And then I love bright blue. So that's all the John Day formation, which is the next younger. And if you take note, there's this donut hole in the middle of the Ochoco Mountains that is Big Summit Prairie. And it's all underlain by the John Day formation. Then the next younger terrain is basalts. It's the picture gorge basalts that are one of the older members of the Columbia River basalts. And you can see this big white blob wraps around Big Summit Prairie and pretty much across most of the Ochoco Mountains. What's not covered by the younger picture gorge basalts is the John Day or the Clarno formations. And then all of those cool little young volcanics coming out of the Cascades. And my favorite, the bright red, is the dormant landslide terrain. Now that's Carrie, all- Carrie, yes. real quick, I'm curious, could you describe about the John Day and the Clarno, what they're made, made of? Because I know oh, these are Oh, I'm gonna be coming. You're leading right into the next Perfect. part of this. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go, Emma. All right, so the John Day and the Clarno, in a nutshell, are both volcanic terrains. But they're enough older. The Clarno is 45, to, they're about 40 to 45 million years. The John Day formation is in that 30 to 26 million years. And the fun thing about both of those is the volcanics are weathering to clay. And you put something like these heavy, heavy basalt, and they're sitting on, on this clay. And oh my gosh, they are running down the hillsides in big, huge rotational landslides, which is what you're seeing off the edge of the, the picture gorge basalts. They're sliding on the Clarno and the John Day. So that's part of what I thought was pretty fascinating. But if you remember from that previous slide, there's a lot of dormant landslide terrain that's not really showing until you do air photo and terp out here on the western end of the Ochoco Mountains. So Andrew, this is why I keep talking to you about what you're finding fun in the strawberries. Oh, let me tell you. 20 years in the Ochoco Mountains, and everybody kept telling me, well, you're not going to see any more landslide terrain if you leave the coast range. And I went, uh, yeah, I just am not seeing rapid shallow events. The other piece of geologic history that we also need to take into account is that it's not just the Clarno and the John Day and the Picture Gorge basalts. We have had this amazing dump of foot and a half of fine volcanic ash, courtesy of Mount Mazama 7,700 years ago. The Ochoco Mountains would have very little soil if it weren't for the fact that it got a foot and a half of fine ash. And that soil through wind has blown into the cracks and crevices in the Ochoco Mountains. If you want to sense a very vague sense of what it might have looked like to folks that were living 7,700 years ago when Mount Mazama erupted. This is what it looked like out my kitchen window in 1980 in Cleelum, Washington with the Mount St. Helens ashfall. And that's just a fraction of what came out of Mount Mazama. That was just a mere one cubic kilometer. Mount Mazama, 100 cubic kilometers of ash. But it also left us with some of the best plant habitat ever. This is a little Ochokinsis 
Lomatium ochukensis that loves our volcanic habitat. So yeah, there's a lot of good that came out of that Mazama ash. Working for the forest, one of the things that the soil scientists, Jim David and I did early on in conjunction with botanists and foresters is we wanted to get a better handle on how to describe the landscape from a, for management activities. So we characterize the landscape. This is running from ecoregions that are at a uh, one to 500,000 scale to, and tying it into the soils mapping, the, the soil resource inventory, which is one inch to a mile type of scale. And we wanted something that brought us a little closer to management planning scale. So we broke out the landscape in terms of north slope, south slope, based on geology and the soils and the plant vegetation. Most of the dormant landslide terrain occurs in the north slope, the south slope, and on both sides, if you ever get a, want to go for a fun field trip, go check out the Maori Mountains. They are really sweet. Um, so that, that's one of the things that we did to get a better handle of the landscape. And part of that, Scab Stringer, I'll sp speak briefly about it because I think it's pretty darn cool. We are looking across Big Summit Prairie, and you can see those pretty little ice cream cone volcanoes on the crest of the Cascades over here. And this is looking west across Big Summit Prairie. There's Allen, Allen Creek Reservoir. This is now looking from north to the south across the prairie. If you remember that earlier photograph, the, the image, this is all John Day formation in the center of the prairie wrapped around by picture gorge basalt. If you look at that picture gorge basalt, it looks like a tic-tac-toe board. One of the things that I won't be talking about much, but I know we've heard in, in previous talks, is this whole idea of the accreted terrains rotating in a clockwise direction. And I believe that these fractures on these brittle basalts are showing that movement of north, northwest trending faults to north-south trending to northeast trending faults all across this brittle picture gorge basalt. So it's the basalts aren't just sliding on the clays, they're also reflecting motion. And, and that's actually what I saw in working in, in the Ochico Mountains. So Carrie, but you now, think that you think when these terrains accreted, they put some kind of pressure on the basalts and then made them rotate and crack the way that they do in that image back there? Actually, um, let's see if I can back up here. So the accreted trains are, you know, they're 100 million, 60 million, 100 million plus in age. They're way at depth be beneath the Clarno and then the John Day. And then you've got the picture gorge basalts that are sitting up on top of that. So it's more a case of whatever started, and this would be back to Andrew and earthquakes and plate tectonics, but whatever started that northward motion of, of the um, Juan de Fuca plate and all of the, you know, the, 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 um, the, the accreted trains that are now parked up in Alaska, is I think from what I'm hearing and reading is pulling these accreted terrains in a clockwise motion off of the our current uh, North American plate edge. And I think these basalts are literally riding on that. They're just reflecting something that's happening at depth. That's my take on it though. I keep getting, I keep asking that question and nobody wants to answer it. So it's, it's like, okay, that's my theory and I'm sticking with it right now until somebody tells me different. But that's a little bit of what ended up happening with this landslide terrain because as a geologist for the Forest Service, I was tasked with looking at geohazards and, among other things. And so over the course of my work hiking all of the terrain for management activities, timber sales, I got to see a lot of different 
landslide trait in a variety of different levels of activities. So you might have a small little debris flow, uh, rotational landslide coming into a creek. And this, yes, this is post hash rock fire. I'll talk about that in a minute. Two, an act, a drainage that is actively sliding. And you got all this fairly recent timber jack straw. And it had nothing to do with the fact that the fire came in here. This was all predated that. This is just a little draw that's in motion. So this dormant landslide terrain exists. So how do you deal with that? Before, before we get to that, I got to show you North Slope. Uh, we'll have to ignore that phone. So this is uh, Spanish Peak, and this is a big, huge rotational landslide going off to the north. And I have not been able to get a good answer for why these were activated. Could it be earthquakes? Could it be sub, uh, subduction zone earthquake? Just general geology movement? I mean, these are huge landslides. And this all predates LIDAR. This was a uh, using, uh, uh, let's see, it was a way of putting together air photos and, and doing a, uh, an interpretation of what now we can look at with LIDAR. But it was a way of looking at this landscape uh, through using geographic information systems. And it was kind of a precursor to what LIDAR does even better. But it was a way of literally seeing this big, huge landslide block that came down off of Spanish Peak. And this was a, a photograph that I took out on a field day looking across at Spanish Peak. Harry, I'm sure I'm handicapped. Uh, by the fact that my computer has stopped showing me video. But I wonder if you could explain um, how it is determined that there is a prior or pre-existing landslide that is dormant. And similarly, how is it determined that there's a pre-existing landslide that has been reactivated? All right, so uh, I move back for folks back to Spanish Peak real quick. You can see that cool little basin that is has been created by this big, huge landslide, this dormant landslide. And I had the good, I don't know, it was one of those long <clears throat> field days, let me tell you, but we hiked in from uh, private land. This is the forest boundary. We hiked in from private land to a little ridge that was midway in that basin. Got in there, took a look at that, and I'm going, hey, cool, it's basically picture gorge basalt and you could see all of the, the flow levels. I could see the top of the flow and I'm looking at it going, oh my gosh, it came from up on top. It was, it used to be rotated back up to the top of Spanish Peak to this big landslide scarp. So you can tell that it was a block that moved within. Now, the one thing about these landslides is over time, the landscape mellows and when, when a portion reactivates, then you can see real evidence of landslide scarps that reappear. But in this case, it was pretty mellow terrain until you take a look at this little basalt ridge and you go, how the heck did that get here? And you realize, well, it came from up on top and it slid down a long way. So focusing in a little closer on Doe Creek, and this may answer some of your questions, Alex. So Doe Creek landslide <clears throat> is a reactivation within dormant landslide terrain. And when this happened, 2000, fall of 2000, we had this little fire uh, sparked by lightning and only a couple strikes started this whole big fire. Hash rock fire blew through the upper end of Mill Creek Wilderness. This was uh, a photo taken on, on August 28th. And uh, for those of you that have been up while uh, Mill Creek, that is twin pillars that we're looking at there. So here's, as far as I knew, this is all mapped Clarno formation. The force account crew came racing in one day and they said, Carrie, Carrie, you gotta go see. We went, drove up this Doe Creek road to try and get better 
phone reception. This is predates a lot of our radios didn't work out there and they were using precursors of like satellite phone type of thing. And so they drove up to get better cell, cell reception and they came back and said, something's happening, the land is moving. Well, we had this cute little sprinkle of snow and it basically made it easy to see all of these tension cracks crossing the road and they buckled up the, the aggregate surfacing to make these cute little tunnels on the middle of the road. I mean, it was like, ooh, cute. And, and it was, I'm, I'm thinking, well, gee, that's kind of interesting. Walking up, I'm looking at these tension cracks, looking down several feet, going, uh, step carefully, guys. We don't know what's going on here. And this is what it looked like on November 6th of 2000. This is totally outside of the fire perimeter. This has nothing to do with the fire. So I went back to the office, pulled up the, the GIS, started looking at what I had mapped in the way of air photo and terp and dormant landslide terrain. And this is what then became Doe Creek landslide. Uh, this is a little later imagery where I actually then added in Doe Creek being active. But you can see there's a lot of dormant landslide terrain in this Mill Creek drainage. This is the crest on to the east, and this is Mill Creek itself, and the fire was way the heck and gone up drainage to the right up there. What's going on? So pull out the air photos. I'm looking where that red arrow is pointing, 1987 resource flight. Don't really see anything real obvious, though when you do stereo pairs, you do see the dormant landslide feature in the middle of that drainage. And this is what it was looking like at that time. You can see, yeah, something's coming through, crossing the road here. Here's a, a lateral scarp that is starting to form. This is the west lateral scarp. And there was a middle scarp and then another one that was down below. What's going on here? Uh, one of the things that was kind of interesting going down Doe Creek, it looked like somebody had pushed up a little trail of, of material. Well, it was a debris trail and the fan came right out <clears throat> and pushed Mill Creek across to the east. So there was a debris fan and that was it's like, okay, so this has been doing this for a while. All right. What are the risks here? What am I looking at? We flew again in 2004, I flew another, and that's when you could then see Doe Creek showing up in the air photos. And this is another image, air photo image of Doe Creek landslide. Now it's not very big, but some of the things to think about is what are the risks to the resource? What caused this landslide? And what percent of the sediment budget is mass wasting, which is landslide material? What percentage is does it take up in this particular drainage? This is a uh, compromised drainage from a fish standpoint. It's a little warmer than the fish really like. However, this drainage up Doe Creek is cold water refugia based on all the springs related to this dormant landslide terrain. I was fortunate enough to find some funding to do some drilling. So you can see this feature just kept moving from what it did in, in early November to later on through December and January, and it was not stopping. I got the survey crew out to help me run a quick little perimeter survey of Doe Creek. And this is what it looked like initially. And I laid out the drill holes to try and get a sense of what's happened in the past, what's happening to the lateral side and what's happening currently 
on the slide mass itself. So those are the three holes that we drilled. And we put in what are called piezometers. They're a way of getting groundwater measurements. And that's what, what uh, I'm doing here is measuring the depth to groundwater. And this is looking at some of the, the well weathered. You had a question about chlorino formation. So this is pretty much a lahar type of material and it is all clay. That is part of that, the drill hole that we got in drill hole one. It was all this iron red clay, but very much volcanic material. And drill hole two was really <clears throat> rocky and it eventually ended up getting covered over by the landslide. There it went, drill hole gone. This, this is showing movement. This is active movement. And it kept moving down toward Doe Creek proper. And I was getting a little nervous because if it hit Doe Creek proper, then it would do back up the perennial creek. And we had the potential for a dam break event, which with private land down drainage down Mill Creek, I was a little nervous. Mm -hmm. The best hole, though, was drill hole three up on the landslide mass because in that hole, we found an in situ zone of Mazama ash. And it was amazing. That was unexpected. I, it was fun to find. And this is this person is about my height, about five foot. And here was drill hole three. Drill hole three within very few days sheared off. It looked like somebody got under underground and tugged down that piezometer and it totally sheared off at about 14 foot, which is where the slide plane was at that point. So it was the poor man's slope movement indicator. I didn't have to put in any special, in, any special instrumentation because nature did it for me. And these were some of the results that we got out of this. We found some charcoal which then confirmed with the age date of the charcoal, it confirmed that the Mazama ash level was just below that and the age date of the charcoal was just a little younger than Mazama. We had water levels and we had slip planes. So here's, here's the water level in this drill hole three and I found two slip planes, an older slip plane and the younger one. And we were taking what's called stand, standard, uh, continuous standard pen penetration information as we were drilling these. And it just tells you about how soft the material is. So you get the management folks out there. Here we're looking at that debris fan toe on Mill Creek. And it's a naturally recurring event. There's road use concerns. There's stream restoration projects in line for this drainage. And there's still the potential for the dam break event. Now, granted, you got to realize this is all happening in 2001 to 2003, 2004. So I'm still going. It wasn't an earthquake. I checked. It wasn't rain on snow event because we hadn't had any rain. It was one of the driest winters ever. There was no rain on snow event. We had this massive wildfire that was up drainage. I had no, it was not north facing, it wasn't north slope. So it wasn't the usual place where you see landslides reactivating. It was south facing, it was dry ground fir, ponderosa pine. Why did this reactivate? I got Scott Burns out there in 2004. Scott came and looked at it and he said, well, don't really know. But yes, it is a cute little dormant landslide. Okay, thank you, Scott. And then Jason McClary and Mark Ferns. This was the best story ever. Jason McClary and Mark Ferns started mapping the Prineville area looking uh, for groundwater. That was what they were tasked with. And their mapping area was literally just 
a seven and a half minute quad map right over Primeville proper. And I said, guys, you got to go on a, we got, we got to go for a, a little road trip here. So I took him up to Doe Creek and I said, you guys going to tell me a story. You got to tell me what's going on here. And they both were looking at me going, uh, well, I don't know, you know, what, let's, let's see what's going on. They had no story at the time, but they did agree. It is an active landslide. Excuse me for a moment. It is an active landslide. So what came out of that? It's a caldera wall failure. 40 million year old Wildcat Mountain caldera and all of this crazy dormant landslide terrain on a south facing slope is literally the walls of this 40 million year old Wildcat Mountain caldera failing. Aha, I had my answer. It was a wonderful story. And it was all because of Jason and Mark extending their mapping area and looking at this crazy feature that I had no answer for. They were just amazing. They actually ended up being able to tell me why it reactivated. And it had nothing to do with a rain on snow event. It was just your normal everyday, hi, I'm a 40 million year old caldera wall and I'm failing. It's okay. It's part of my, my story. It's part of the way I react. So it was wonderful to get that answer. What I did is I did continue finishing through the 15 years that, uh, since it, acti it activated in 2000, and I uh, kept up the annual surveys to monitor the movement. And initially, within the first few years, Doe Creek was moving 50 to 60 feet downslope a year. In about 2004, it sprung a leak at the toe of the landslide, and it took till 2008 before we actually had spring vegetation growing at that new spring that was at the toe of the landslide. So it, it was a fun little study. And when I initially started in 2001, the landscape was rough and jagged and cracks and trees falling all over the place. By 2013, the landscape had mellowed out, even just in that 12 years, the landscape had started mellowing out. The poor trees that had had their roots ripped out had died and fallen. There's actually, if you look carefully, there's new pine trees growing. So the slide mass is, is getting new vegetation. It's mellowing out. It doesn't look anywhere near as angry and fresh as it did in 2000 and 2001. So over time, these features do mellow. And that's just in my time of doing the study. So imagine what that landscape will look like in another 10,000 years, which that's actually the reactivation time period for that piece of real estate. The last time it had reactivated was a little over 9,000 years ago. That's what that older slip plane and the charcoal gave us the dates on that. So looking Carrie, at the- Carrie can, I, Carrie, can I just ask, especially on the last slide, I, I'm, I'm a little bit curious. Obviously these landslides don't move fast enough for, for any visual observation of movement, but let's say in, in five or maybe a year or whatever time period you want, how far would that, the previous slide, how far how fast would that be flowing? Um, a, a foot a year, a foot every five years, or what? <laughs> no, initially when, when that landslide reactivated in 2000 and I had stable hubs uh, outside of the landslide and moving hubs on the landslide mass itself, it was moving 50 to 60 feet down slope every year for the, yeah, right, Andrew, for the first, Four, four to five years. And I was getting uh -huh. really nervous because I kept thinking, oh, this is not good. This is not good. You can see where the rig is, the green rig is parked there. Okay. It wasn't that much further beyond the end of that rig. And you drop down into Doe Creek itself, the print, the, the cold water refugia. 
And I kept looking at that landslide going, please stop, please stop, please stop. Don't keep moving at that rate. It was like Standing at the top of the landslide initially at the upper scarp, if you think about holding a blanket, I'm going to see if start my video again. It's like holding a blanket and you flip up the blanket and it has a big curve at the top and then that rolls down to the edge of the blanket on the floor. When you're making a bed or or rolling the sheet around to make a bed. And that's literally what this landscape was doing. The largest mass initially was up just off the landslide scarf, kind of what we were seeing at, at that one down at La Jolla. So you've got that big block up top and literally what this material was doing over time was moving the mass further and further down slope. And I saw that in indicated in in the the survey work that I was doing. So thank heavens in 2004, this slide mass, water is what usually drives landslides. This slide mass right from the get go, you didn't get any water, not up at the head scarp, not on the lateral scarps until you punch your fist into the slide mass itself. And then it was squishy and wet inside but everything else was bone dry. It was not acting like anything on the North Slope. North Slope, it was so soupy wet all the time on any of those reactivations on the North Slope. But here it was bone dry and I'm going, I know water's driving this, what happened to the water? Where's And it finally created a network of, of capillary action. It literally popped a hole, a spring, created in 2004 at the toe of the landslide. It took another four years before spring vegetation started growing. So this is where groundwater dependent ecosystems go all over the Ochoco Mountains. And that's where you get a lot of our great groundwater is expressing in these springs. And that's what was going on at the toe slope of Doe Creek landslide. So. At that point, when it sprung a leak, it said, oh, I'm done moving. I'll move a little bit. And it would shake its shoulders and do a little movement. But it, for all practical purposes, stopped moving. But that was literally what was going on from 2001 to 2013. So one of the things that I think we need to recognize is landslides are a common feature across the state, all the way from the coast range, clear through to the Hawaii country over near Idaho. And Andrew's looking at some of that stuff in the strawberries. So this is, this is one of these things that there's a, a mis, misconception that all the landslide train, uh, you know, those rapid shallow events are only, it's all west side. No, not so much. The Ochoco Mountains have these large rotational landslides, and I still want to know why. I don't know if it's uplift of the Ochoco Mountains. That could only, you know, that, that would account for the stuff off the north slope, but doesn't account for the stuff off the south side. It does take in the Ochoco Mountains have an 11 percent or a little over 78,000 acres that that I've mapped both with LIDAR. I ground truth with LIDAR before I retired. That was way cool. But so I was able to do all that air photo and TERP and then ground truth it with the LIDAR as well as field time. But you're talking 11% of what should be really dry country is showing dormant landslide terrain. And the best part, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Jason. I have an answer. The Doe Creek landslide is with the 40 within the 40 million year old Wildcat Mountain caldera. And it's the caldera walls that are failing. So woohoo! I mean, that was something that I couldn't get a good answer until they said, oh, well, that's what's going on. Thank you. We had an answer. So that is landslide terrain in the state in the Ochago Mountains and a little tiny story of Doe Creek landslide. And Scott's answer to Doe Creek, oh, it's a really cute little landslide. It doesn't even hold a candle to anything that I work with over on the Cascades. And I'm going, thank you. <laughs>
but at least he came over and took a look at it for me because I needed somebody to tell me what what to confirm that I really was seeing a reactivation and did he have and he gave me some ideas for how to study it so this is where you reach out the take home mes message Emma Andrew is reach out to folks because the folks the land managers that uh, that you're uh, doing the studies on those different landscapes have probably observed some features that if they're not geologists, they may not understand, but they'll have gone, well, you know, this this keeps changing here and I don't know what's going on. They might have a, and it's worth letting them know that you're doing that study because I don't know if you guys have touched base with the hyd hydrologists and the fish bios, but the hydros and you're doing groundwater dependent e ecosystem surveys, the botanists want to know about those cute little plants and they want to know about those springs and they want to know about, well, what did you see when you were looking at that glacial terrain and did you see more springs or not? So anyway, questions? Well, thank you, Carrie, for that was very interesting. Um, I'm going to stop the recording here since we're a little bit over and open up the room for questions until 1230.